You could use a punch mark or a scribe line. It's bracket. I can't play right now. I'm recording a voiceover. No, this is important. Yes, you're important too. All right, I can do this later. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Sooner or later, every hobbyist wants to make a sphere or hemisphere or other complex curved shape on the lathe. There are exotic tools for doing this. You can get tracer attachments and ball turners and things like that. But I'm going to show you how to make any complex curve accurately, no less, on a lathe with only a parting blade and a dial indicator. So let's go. I'm going to make a hemisphere because it will be quick and easy to demonstrate. Here's a little CAD drawing of what I want to make, this little hemisphere at the end of a straight shaft. Zooming in on that madness in the lower right corner here will illustrate what we're going to be doing. Now you need to make a drawing like this for the curve that you want to create. I did it in CAD, but you don't have to. You can do it on graph paper with a little bit of trigonometry just as easily. Well, not just as easily. The rectangles there are the width of my parting blade. The thinner your parting blade is, the better this process works. I've laid out a series of rectangles, the width of my parting blade, starting from a common baseline that is the outermost edge of the curve that I want to create. Then I've measured the distances to the left edge of each of those rectangles from the center line of the radius that I want to create. And finally, I've measured the distance from that baseline into where the left corner of the parting blade is going to touch the surface. And these are the cuts that we're going to make. And this is going to start the process of creating this hemisphere. I'm going to demonstrate in steel here because what's great about this method is that it works in even tough materials. For example, you might consider using a form tool for small radii, but on a small lathe like this in, say, tool steel or titanium, something like that, you're going to have no hope of cutting it with a form tool. This method will work with just about anything. I start by facing the end to create a reference surface. This will ultimately be the end of our hemisphere, so that's an important surface. I'm going to take it out of the lathe now and create a reference feature for the center of the radius that I'm going to create. In this case, I've put a 1 8 hole there, but you could use a punch mark or a scribe line or some other feature on the part, you know, any kind of reference that you can use. Concentricity is fairly important here for an accurate sphere, especially since I'm not machining the OD of this stock. So I want to get it nice and concentric. Now, I happen to get lucky with the position of the stock in my three jaw here, and I've got less than a thou of run out, but you might want to use a collet chuck or dial it in on the four jaw. Now I can bring in the parting blade. It's important that it be very square to the work, so I'm going to square it up on the end that we faced there to ensure that that is the case. The next trick for this method is to choke up the parting blade as much as you can get away with. The thinner your parting blade is, the better this technique works, but the more the blade might tend to wander, and you need to do some deep cuts potentially with this technique. So choke that blade up as much as you can to gain as much rigidity as you can. And with this style of tool holder where the top rake is built into the holder, every time you change the length of the blade, you also have to get the height set. So I put it at the back of the tool post, pointed at the tailstock, and used that to get the center height right, as you can clearly see right through the transparent bar there. Now it's time to get the left edge of the parting blade lined up on the reference feature for the center of the curve. So because I'm using a hole as my reference, I put a gauge pin in there, and I'm just getting the left edge aligned with the right edge of the gauge pin there. I'm doing that by feel and checking for deflection in the blade. And then I use a dial indicator to move the carriage left the radius of that pin, and that'll put the left edge of the blade right on the center of my radius. You could also use a scribe line or a punch marker, whatever your curve reference was. Then I flip the indicator over to the other side of the carriage and put a light preload on it because we're going to need to measure the carriage travel. And this needs to be absolute, not relative. So make sure you've got an indicator that's long enough for the entire feature that you want to create. Or of course, if you have a DRO, then that's a lot easier. Going back to the chart here for a second, some of our cuts that we're about to make will be what I'm calling zero cuts. That is, the depth of the parting blade at the left edge is right on that baseline there. So these cuts will be skipped, and in this case, the first cut is such a cut. So I'm going to start with my carriage translated to 63 thou, and we're effectively starting with the second cut. Next step is to find the baseline of our curve, which was that dotted line at the bottom of the chart there. So I'm going to bring in the parting blade very, very slowly and very lightly touch off on that surface. 
Once I'm touched off, then I zero my cross light hand wheel, or DRO if you have it, even better, and we can start making chips. So I bring the parting blade in to my first depth, which in this example is a very shallow 6 thou. That's 12 thou off the diameter. I come back out and then I move my carriage to the next position on my chart, which is 126. You don't want to do this in incremental 63 thou moves because you're going to accumulate error if you do that. So that's why it's best to do this with a single long travel indicator. Once we're at depth for that cut, I come back out, I move over to the next value on my chart, and I move in and do the next cut. And I just proceed all the way down the line, moving over on the one indicator and using my cross light hand wheel, or if you like, an indicator on the cross light or your DRO to cut to depth at each position. If you're a little bit inaccurate on one of your lateral moves there, you may end up with a little bit of a razor washer there. So just go ahead and bring that down to the highest step to its left there. That'll happen if you get a little bit of an error reading your indicators. At this point, we have what looks like a little beehive. And if you have any CNC experience, you will recognize that as the roughing pass that a CNC mill would do. So we're just, you know, human numerical controlling this. It also kind of looks like a round ziggurat, which I don't know, maybe ziggurats were never round. I'm not an archaeologist. I just really wanted an excuse to use the word ziggurat in a sentence. Yeah, uh, anyway, the next important step here is to mark the end of the part with Sharpie and also the side of where the curve is going to start there. This is key for obtaining accuracy. And you can see how the red has conveniently stopped itself on the first ledge there, as physics dictates that it would. And now it's time for, yeah, you knew this was coming, the file. I'm filing down those steps now, and I'm using a relatively fine file. A lathe file is even better if you have one. They have very oblique teeth on them, designed to run at higher speeds. Don't run the lathe too fast. Keep the file moving so you're using lots of the teeth, and keep it clean as you go. So you can flip it over once, and then when both sides are clogged up, then just use a brush to clean it out. I don't like using file cards. I find them a little aggressive, but little brush periodically there to keep the file clean and you'll be cutting very quickly here. You don't need an aggressive file, you just need to keep the file clean. Okay, but what's the big deal? Every cat knows you can file round things on the lathe, right? Well, remember this is about making accurate curves. The trick is that the step turning and the sharpie marks give you a topographical map of where to focus your filing. You can tell visually from the thickness of the lines where you need to spend more time filing. So the bottom line here is thicker than the other two, so I need to focus more filing on there. Furthermore, the red at the top gives us our reference for the top of the curve. When that sharpie mark has been filed back to the center line of that reference hole, then I know the top is complete. And on the end, when the red is down to a single dot, then I know the end of the curve is correct. It doesn't sound like much, but those little visual cues while you're filing make all the difference in the world. I am not a skilled filer by any means, but even I can make an accurate curve with very little difficulty just with those visual cues. If you're getting nervous as you go, you can stop and check with a radius gauge, and that will also tell you where to focus more filing. It's always good to put a light under these gauges to be sure, because especially with a curved surface, if the gauge isn't right on the center line of the curve, then it's gonna lie to you. So the light will reveal the truth. From here, just proceed until the lines all disappear and the Sharpie marks are where they're supposed to be. It's really that simple. If you get a little heavy handed with the file or the lathe is running a little fast, you can get some chatter marks in the curve as you see there that I have. So you can either Continue filing a little lighter to remove those, or you can bring in some emery. And you can also bring in some emery just to shine it up. You can polish this. You can go as far as you want with this appearance-wise. With polishing an emery, you're really not going to alter the shape appreciably, so you aren't going to lose your accuracy doing this. I've still got a couple of chatter marks in there, but you get the idea. So I'll bring the radius gauge in here, and there you go. You can see how accurate that is, 
And once again, I'm not a skilled filer, so this is very accurate and no fancy tools required. One more note on the importance of that red sharpie mark on the end of the curve. The end of the curve is likely to be a reference for some other feature in your design, so you want to make sure that that surface is preserved. For example, if I want to make a groove a relative distance from the end of that sphere, then I'm going to want to be able to put the tool up against that surface and measure downwards and know that I'm going to end up in the correct place. If you get carried away and file all of the sharpie mark off the end of your curve, you're going to lose that reference surface. And also remember at the top of the show when we faced that surface, that's the last remaining bit of that surface and it's likely to have been a reference for other features. So you want to preserve at least a little red dot there. Mathematically it should be an infinitely small dot, but you know, a small dot is good enough. I've demonstrated a simple hemisphere here, but it's certainly not limited to that. This technique can be used for any complex series of curves that you want to do. If you're making chess pieces, for example, or other complex curves, the same method works just fine. If you're doing concave surfaces, you're going to need smooth round files that can be used on the lathe to get in there, and you're probably going to want to make a cardboard template or something to match up the curve the way that I used the radius gauge for this curve. And of course, there's plenty of other ways to make curved features on the lathe involving fancy tools. There's a method involving a boring head on the milling machine. You can use form tools or ball turners, but this method you can use with stuff you already have in your toolbox on any lathe, on any material. It's really quite easy. I hope you found this useful. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you to my patrons who make all of this possible, and I will see you next time.